This is the full Game 3 VOD of the matchup between T1 and Gen G from the semifinals of Worlds 2024. One was my wedding. This is this is how you know that I, I guarantee this is going to be an incredible series. Those were the other two best uh, we, days of my life. We you know? thank you for your work, Atlas. It's <laughs> You're greatly welcome. You're appreciated. Welcome. As uh, going into this game, number three draft, no surprises. Although that Yone ban yeah. coming out on the side of T1 here. Aurora still going to get taken out. The Ash still up. Skarner still up as well. Jax available. Skarner Jax would be the kind of no-brainer one-two here for Genji. The BLG approach, as yep. we like to call it. Certainly a favorite for them in their semifinal that went pretty well. Uh, you could say for BLG. We'll see whether that is exactly where Genji are going to go. Not deciding to switch up the picks here, as it will be the Jacks to be locked in first. And I think that you know, you don't talk about hovers is something that we sometimes talk about. This is a hover that you can probably talk about. Yeah, I think you'd be pretty confident with that yeah. one, Atlas, yeah, yeah. especially it's safe. with yep. uh, with Keen. Now the question is, will it be a third game? Skana, I'm gonna hazard a guess and say yes. Canyon, of course, has showcased a wealth of different champions. His Maokai win rate this year is almost as good as his Nidalee win rate. I mean, the man is very versatile in terms of the jungle role, and they're actually, Ooh. based on the harvest, holding off on that lock-in. Chovy's win rate with Ari so far in the best of fives hasn't been the strongest, but last game, he had the Veda over Faker. He was able to have a lot of mid control thanks to the Ari pick and what was happening around the map and we'll see what the response is here from T1. Also ties into Chovy's approach. Often as a player, if he thinks a champion is the best, we'll just keep picking that until the antithesis is proven. Renata coming through. Again, Carrier having an incredible game, and we will call oh, it for this, and I, I love it here as well. Always going to feel strong. The only thing for Gen.G, you do have the opportunity to pick up like Ezreal here. Does mean your jungle pool is going to get pinched, but getting a non-stationary AD carry, I think is going to be a really big deal because otherwise the team fights are going to be really hard to play out. Depends what he has planned. Could be something else here as well as that Ari Nocturne combo that they swept through Swiss with is going to be locked away. Canyon, he is sick of playing this Skana and I could understand uh, no shade cap, but I just... I don't know, it's just, it just doesn't do very much damage. You only build health, it's just less fun. Uh, nice. The Nocturne, who does slashy slashy. You are setting up very clearly for a Kai'Sa pick here for Genji. You imagine that's going to be banned away by T1. The backline threat onto the Ash is very lethal. The Kindred, I think, is... Uh, it's a really good matchup into the Nocturne. Yeah. Uh, you just went out on the skirmishes, so they're going to remove that. Wouldn't be surprised to see the Vi removed, to be honest, with the amount of mobility on the side of Genji. Just take that away from Ona, one of his best champions. Yeah, protecting a lot of bands as well, because T1 basically have to ban Kai'Sa Ezreal. And so it's going to be Pretty relatively much. telegraphed um, what they're going to be taking into this game. Of course, T1 not too worried about it because Ash Renata is just they universally strong. Yeah, yeah I was about to say, Ezreal is another, but I think the Ziggs makes a ton of sense given what we've seen so far. And, and I, yeah, I, then you get Ezreal. So I guess they're, yeah. that's the three picks that they were happy to grab. And if you've got three, then you're not too worried. Noteworthy as well that the Silas did still get banned, even though Chovy did a really good job in that matchup, still going to deny it. And I think it's ulti. because of the Nocturne, yeah. right? So much of the value is because <laughs> you're the one is the, the Twitch Nocturne actually going to be denied here. And I think it makes sense given how insanely annoying that look to play against. They thought that Lehenz was going to go back to his Shen. That's what was going to happen. But as there's the Ezreal. Ezreal. That makes a lot of sense. He, I mean, he could still theoretically play Shen, but it's not going to be. I thing. like this Gen G draft. I really do. I think it's very solid. It makes a lot of sense in the context of how Gen G likes to play. These two last picks are going to be crucial. The mid jungle from T1. Faker has had a phenomenal world so far. Pairing up alongside Ona, they've been doing a good job together. The question is, what plan have they got for Canyon Chovy? Let's just see. Wanting probably a little bit of physical damage from that mid lane. We'll see where T1 are going to go. Oh. Never mind. Oh. Okay, Yasuo could be an option. Whoa. Yeah, Kali oh. really oh. did. And he's going to lock it in. I think if you were watching Worlds last year, you understand this is one of the ones that Fake is pretty good at. Hasn't been playing it very much this year, however. Still, uh, this guy has played competitively it's like be Vi, 80 right? different champions. It's gotta so be. he's fine. And that's going to be the Vi locked away for Ona. Although they do have a bit of time to think about it, I still think that they don't need to worry. 
And so it's relying on Vi and Ash as far as that physical damage is concerned, but I think that the damage profile kind of okay. It's just range that might catch them out, but the way to start fights is what we were looking for after game two. It's such a peak T1 comp as well. So much upfront burst allowing you to play towards that bailout, which is something they love to do. Owner on a champion with a lot of engage and playmaking potential. And what is Lahens gonna pick here? This time the Blitzcrank is open. But it looks like instead they're going to go for something a lot more well-rounded. And they did have a really good game on it in game number two. Yep, the pretty standard option in the realm. But like you say, I actually think playing for Lahenz's comfort is a really good idea after what we saw in game one and the rest of this tournament. Because Lahenz has kind of been the weak link here for Gen G. Not in game two, though. Trying to carry that one forward does make a lot of sense. Now, when we think of Faker, there are a slew of champions that you can attribute to his name, right? Uh, of course, Akali is definitely up there in terms of a champion that he's had a lot of presence on. But Knight yesterday beautifully demonstrated oh, what this champion can do to an Ezreal. And uh, that is what T1 is envisioning in this game. That level of execution damage is incredibly high. And when you've got a Vi there to dive alongside you with the potential of the Ash Arrow pick, no cleanse is going to save you from a Vi and an Akali duo. But it's about being in a position to really execute on that. Because Genji have a lot of skirmishing threats themselves. The Jax was a huge problem in the previous game. And I can tell you right now, Ash isn't going to have an easier time in this game compared to the Caitlyn on the last one. Renata is going to be crucial in the usage of the ultimate. And I think that, again, Genji have a pretty straightforward and easy comp to execute. I would agree. I think that there is a lot of pressure on T1, but I want to go back to what you were saying, Chronicler. This is a T1 draft. We were watching the World Final last year. The only difference about this one in comparison to that is that was a mental snowball that they were rolling on, right? This was a T1 that was sweeping a series. This time, they have to utilize it to come back from a deficit here after losing game number two. But here we are onto the rift. See whether they can make it work. Gonna be looking at the lane assignments. Also, do know Chovy going for a grasp again. Would expect him to try and keep Faker down, particularly those first six levels is where the Akali can really struggle. Certainly is. But remember, ladies and gentlemen, you need to log into your right account on lollysports.com and earn worlds and uh, watch Worlds Live to earn exclusive emotes, icons, capsules, all that cool stuff. We've got a little bit of time here. You're not going to miss too much. So you can hop on over and he can get that one done just to get some free stuff. It's really cool. Okay, Zayas is standing on a ward uh -oh. and there are a lot of bad guys in the brush. Uh oh. Oh, oh no, there's the charm that crashed down as well. It's a dead Gragas. It's going to take a little bit of time because he's relatively tanky, but still, that's first blood going over to Pays. And maybe that makes Faker's job a little bit harder. That ward so crucial. Spotting Zayas out. I don't think Chovy's flash was necessary, but he committed it anyway to guarantee that pick. And Genji start off game three with first blood. And Chovy's flash doesn't even matter all that much because it's Akali that he's leaning against. That Not a lot true. of kill threat in the first uh, five levels. So he should be absolutely fine navigating this one. He's also Chovy, does kind of like the laning phase in general. As we're going to see standard lanes here for likely the first time. Do have Pays now walking up. Tear from the start. Oh, God. Something you're going to be very happy about just in what it means for your spikes. Because obviously, it doesn't really give you any combat stats early. And in this lane, Lahens and Pays are just playing to clear the waves, don't be diveable, and get to your items. Two items for Ezreal is always the main breakpoint. From that point on, he only gets stronger. And we do see. Both junglers starting an opposite set uh, of the map, although Canyon, I think, started his Raptors then path down. Whereas Owner just doing a full topside clear and maybe looking to impact this bot side. And these trades are actually really valuable because it could set up for a possible dive towards the bot side of the map. I will say it's nice to see move away from uh, the lane swap only because while T1, I think, in the Swiss stage really had phenomenal execution on the lane swap. This, to me, is the bread and butter of Gumayushi and Carrier. Their 2v2 laning prowess has been so incredible. And uh, while I think this summer, of course, question marks always with yeah. what it comes yeah. to T1 and summer, at this World Championship, watching this bot lane 2 versus 2 has been a joy to watch. And you're seeing it right now. They know the strength and the advance that they have. They don't care about the tier. They know that with this Ash Renata, they can bully this duo as much as they like. Yeah, and I, I think that this is the biggest benefit of not having a lane swap this time around. And it's curious that Gen.G didn't decide to opt into it themselves. Maybe just saying that now that we've got a kill on our Ezreal, we're going to be okay. But a tier doesn't really give you a whole lot of stats. Still, the fact that the wave is going to be pushing out 
And Hayes can pick up a bunch of farm underneath the turret. That's going to be okay. Is Faker only hit by the non-true damage part of the Orbit Deception after a couple of abilities go his way? Not going to be feeling too bad here as he's playing with his health bar into Jovi in this lane. Now, the Ari Akali matchup is pretty interesting because once you get to level five, you can actually start winning out very easy on a lot of trades for the Akali just because the bonus movement speed from the W makes it very easy to sidestep the E from uh, coming out from the Ari. The problem is when you go for the Electrocute over the Fleet Footwork, it's very easy for Chovy to kind of chip away at your HP bar when you're trying to farm. And it means the Faker's in this awkward spot where he now needs the wave to bounce back into him, which is happening, fortunately. Uh, but it's this weird, awkward middle ground where he's now relying on his um, uh, Doran shield to kind of mitigate and heal back up in this uh, midterm of the lane. It's also, again, the grasp. And I do think that we have seen in the past That's players true. really get caught off guard by just the extra amount of health that can give you. Akali, in particular, plays around kill windows so well, but if your first couple of plays don't end up working out and you fall behind the curve, can be really hard to play out as... Obviously, Canyon just wants to do exactly this, which is just farm. And even though they don't spot him directly, if they see his top side is down, we'll, be no, uh, we'll know that he's on the bottom side of the map. But it's an early game Nocturne, not really expecting a lot. But that does mean that Keen is actually in a really awkward spot. His wave state not looking good, already chunked to half, and owner is on the top side of the map. And full information over to T1 as well as Kanye walks see. over that ward. They know, knew exactly, they had an idea of where he was, but then they get full confirmation. Now Canyon is going to try and clear that one out. Does get information of the ward he just walked over. Yeah, read the Keen. movement. Yeah, as a result, Keen actually just going to go for a recall right here, not wanting to uh, risk too much. And despite the fact that Faker has sat on below half health for the majority of this lane, he has kept these minions really pushed towards Chovy. So it does give a lot of control over to T1. Yeah, it's it's very awkward for him because uh, Chovy's holding onto a monstrous freeze. The idea is Faker, you try and get those early pushes in, then you get the bounce back. But Chovy's like, no, I'm good. Now the wave will finally bounce back, but he ticks over to level six. Ideally, Faker wants to back now so that the wave will freeze here. And now Chovy's back is a little bit awkward. He's going to try and interrupt Faker. It will be crucial if he does. Massive, oh, wow. massive, He was massive. on that ward, as we can see. I thought he was actually just a prophet, but no. Oh, they've actually brought the bot lane over towards mid to catch this wave. Faker can now actually TP bot and go lane against Pays, who can still... Oh, Body Slam going to miss. That could be a big deal here. They're evening out the health trades that have been going pretty consistently in Zeus's favor. Chovy looking to TP back towards his lane. Will be able to do so. And the first objectives spawning now. We have the Grubs online. Drake's there as well. You can argue either team is, is very happy to just wait to level six. You have a Vi composition on one end, a Nocturne on the other. It's just going to be a trade here. Does mean that this time Genji not going to have the Jacks with uh, an unreasonable amount of grubs. Even certainly. early trades here. Certainly feels good um, for T1. This time it's going to be a trade, so it's not going to be the, you know, the grubs team picking up all of the dragons as well. Feeling a lot more even. Drop secured, and uh, I think both teams are quite happy with the current game state. Obviously, T1 are setting their sights on a top lane play right now. Keen level six has those resist resistances. No Ash Lahans. Arrow available yet. Yeah, Lahan's looking to get himself into position. I think they had an idea that something was going down. Notably, Canyon not quite level six just yet. Doesn't have that paranoia up and available as T1 don't opt in for any sort of dive attempt. But Keen still wanting to get aggressive on Nagumi Ishii, who does have to cleanse pushes him away. So just going to be able to settle for the uh, summoner spell and just move off. Nicely as well. Genji have moved Pays out of the bot lane matchup in towards mid where he's much safer. That means that they can keep Chovy into the Faker matchup where the Ari can continue to bully out on the Akali. With level 6 coming through and level 7 being a crucial breakpoint for Akali just because she's going to get her Q at level 4, which I think is it's either about 80 energy or about 70, but it makes the Q rotations much more comfortable when it comes to trading in the lighting phase. Vision control here for T1. Do you have Canyon, but he's backing, wanting to spend his earned gold from Ash those arrow. four players. Oh god, okay, the arrow is going to connect, the Counter-Strike wears off, but there's the cease and desist! And he can't flash Leap Strike out of that one, and even though he had the Grandmaster's might, he's still going down. That is going to be a kill going over, equaling things out for T1. A classic T1 trap springs on Keen. Get a kill onto Vi, and also get the flash out of Keen. I love that you called it a classic because it truly is that idea that T1 makes it look like they've gone back to base, but they stay on the map a little bit longer to catch you pushing that wave out, and it works to perfection. They're able to equalize the kills, and T1 find their first of the game.
And I love this. I feel like it harkens back to something that Chovy was talking about in the tease earlier on. The fact that, you know, Faker was known so much for these mind games that he plays. I think it's all of T1 that does those mind games now. It used to be maybe a little bit too much with excessive Barons being started every single game. It becomes less of a mind game and more of a you do this every game. A bad habit, perhaps. Yeah, kind of. Um, but they are always just trying to push these advantages, trying to find opportunities where their opponents don't have enough information uh, to be able to do what they want. So really nicely done here from T1 to try and claw back a bit of control of this game. But right now, Plate should be going over to, Genji, uh, to Chovy here. As Akuma not going to be too worried. Canyon, level 7. Again, it's a relatively slow early game. Kind of what we've come to expect from these two teams as they prioritize farming. But also, it just goes to show how difficult it is to kill these players. Like, there's a reason why Gumayushi went deathless for so long, and he's still only got a single death to his name, yeah. even though Genji oh, absolutely stomped. KDA. Yes, it is. Oh, you love that. And uh, it's a situation where both teams just play the map very well. They're constantly fishing for opportunities. They're playing for these early plates. But uh, it's uh, the Grubs now become the next big point of contention. A minute away, both junglers already setting up some vision around the top side of the map. Keen. I imagine he wants to get a quick base in before the objective spawns, but that could be a window for Guma to already then push out mid and then set up on the top side river. As we get into this fight, on one hand, how is Gen G going to be able to absorb the amount of backline threat that's there? Because T1 can split up a fight very easily with the Grag Assault, and obviously it has owner oh, to start him out. Trying to come on through here as Zess is looking to take the fight to Keen. Does find some nice body slams. There's the slowdown as well. Leap strike just to try and escape. And you can see Canyon. Oh, he was looking for it. A potential angle as Kane able to sidestep, but that does buy some space. Still, owner not going to be committing because they didn't know exactly where Canyon was. That could have been a follow-up. I'm actually very surprised. Keen had no flash, and Ono with ulti was in range. I think he could have committed, but I guess because Keen hadn't used his E yet, they were hesitant to really fully commit to the play. Regardless, the damage was done. Zayas has already gone back to base. He's now back out onto the map before Keen has had an opportunity to, but Keen's TP is available. Uh, are they going to contest this? Just have to say, I think six scrubs is going to be pretty valuable. Oh, that's a big TP. Is, yeah, the teleport flank angle is coming in here. Keen, good position to start this one off. He's just beelining right in there. Paranoia comes down. They do throw out the ulti carrier, trying to keep them at bay. And oh, no. There goes Lahens. And now Faker is caught on to Keen. Lands the shuriken. And he's going to wait for the leap strike. There's the max range Q. And that's Faker's Akalia world, ladies and gentlemen. And that is Faker coming in huge, but it's the team response from T1 that's the biggest thing here. Chovy couldn't join that fight. I think Gen G was expecting them to back off when the Nocturnals came through, but T1 said, no, we can take it. And they take a big lead here in game number three. We talked about how this composition is very much true to the style of T1, and their ability to take these early skirmishes wasn't there in game two, but you can see how prepared they were. Owner and Carrier were the focus at the start of the fight. Carrier, though, has the passive to be able to reborn, and then, of course, also has the ultimate available too. So even though they're getting collapsed on by every single side, the TP comes in, a nice flash comes out. Carrier doesn't care that he's getting focused on the Gragas then arrives, and crucially, as you said, Chovy can't join the fight. Yeah, and uh, Keen and Lahens spent most of that fight fighting each other because of that hostile takeover that came in. Faker gorgeous on the five-point strike there. You see T1 with Reckless in the back. Uh, feeling pretty happy about this one. And Helper and Mata getting more and more stressed as this game goes on. Still, a lot of game left to play here. We are tied up in this series. We'll see whether Gen.G can claw their way back to an even game state after that big lead has been acquired. About 2.5K, now the lead for T1. Pace has got to have to do a lot of heavy lifting. A lot of the gold for Gen.G is on him, but into a fat Akali and owner also getting bigger and bigger. They're looking to punish Keen again. This Jax not having a great time. Four men at the ready. All right, Canyon does have that paranoia up and available. They know exactly where he is. This is a big gamble if Genji do decide to go for it once again. Chovy is very far away, but this time has the teleport up and available. Nice little stun to come through there as Keen now with the Counter-Strike on cooldown. They're trying to deal with these waves, but another one, Conga lining in. This War of Attrition looks to just be going in T1's favor, especially with all those grubs, the Void Mites, and everything like that. Genji just going to back away. Genji 
seeding more. And, and T1, no, like we don't have to dive this. We can just poke them down. The only way with the uh, range that Genji have that they can ever really push back is if they actually hard commit. But because of the vision, T1 knows everyone is in the area. Chovy was showing on top wave, and they weren't worried about a possible collapse. The timing was fantastic as well. T1 had gotten a deep push into top side, which meant that Chovy went to go and answer. Bear in mind that he's a large part of Genji's wave clear. So while he's present top, it gives T1 the ability to force stack bot. They then keep Zeus in mid. He catches the wave there, and they don't really lose anything. Sure, Zeus lost like half a wave in the top side of the map. And crucially, Chovy does have an experience advantage over Faker, but he should be able to claw that back as long as he starts matching in the side lane. He's got his fully completed rocket belt, which means that he's now going to be a much more of a threat in the 1v1. It's telling that the Ari, Nocturne, Jack's composition doesn't want to fight for Herald. And when you look at these two compositions, it does really feel extremely volatile. Because they are both so short range, you really, once you find yourself in a deficit, have to be extremely clean with your fight selection as this bot lane turret will go, but the Herald might be dropped in mid. There it is. Yep, that's going to be even more money going over to T1. They're happy to trade these turrets because this is so much more map control as Canyon's doing his very best to try and clear things out. Dustbringer should be able to help as there's the charge. Six and this turret's not going to be long for the world. Oh my god, the damage. The arrow's going to connect. The lance trying to crash his way out. But Gumi Yushi says no. He has his bow primed and it's another... Oh, never mind. Not another charge. That's a smite coming through. Oh. Maybe it was a bait. He's an assassin. It's a double kill. He's able to get the arcane ship, but just barely clipped by the hostile takeover. And Genji cannot do anything this game. I mean, it's just a beatdown from T1. If game two is the TP. Six, oh god, okay, there's gonna be five people towards this top side of the map as Pay's looking to try and get on in there. Another cast. Keen is just being thrown around by it like a ragdoll. And it's another kill for Gumiyushi as a result. Genji not able to do anything. Faker just utilizing the second portion of his ultimate because he can. And it's all of a sudden a 6,000 gold lead. It's just a relentless barrage of punch after punch. And T1 are not letting up. They use the Herald mid. Lehend with a slight overstep gets collapsed on. The burst damage from Ona and Kuma mean that he drops first. And then look at this play. Canyon thinks that he can punish Carrier, but the way in which Ona turns this around, connects the Q, the ulti to follow, the Ash passive is stacked, and they're able to get a double for Guma. And what's crazy is they didn't even slow down there because Faker was pushing out the top wave. They turn to top, they get that objective as well. They get another kill. It's, uh, it's gone from bad to worse uh, for Genji in this one, but T1 really showing that this bounce back was real. And coming into this series, they'd only played on blue side one time. This is the third time they've been on, been on blue side this uh, whole world, which is kind of crazy to me because they do love this side of the map. And they are demonstrating to us that in this series, it is not going to be any different. And hope, like, what, I'm, what I'm trying to get to here is that we might have five games, and that'd be super <laughs> cool. Well, well, the T1, when they are playing a comp that feels like it fits them, versus the T1 that oh, yeah. is on something like we saw last game, is night and day. I mean, there, there is like a perfect example for this. We have the stats for Keen on Jax in the last game. If you compare that to what he's doing now in this game, it is absolutely night and day. And Zeus on this Gragas in comparison to the Maokai is incredible. Speaking of which, he's going to get tagged by that arrow. Still, there was no one there to follow up. So he's just going to be denied a turret take. That's uh, going to be down very, very low, but still not going to be the money going over to Genji. Look how scared they have to play as well. And the only saving grace for Genji, which by itself is not enough, is that they do have two dragons. The problem is you're playing into T1, and we, we all know that as soon as the Baron is online, they're going to just start pulling it consistently. This Drake, obviously Genji, Never going to contest, but I don't think Gen G is ever going to give, or a T1 rider is ever going to give Gen G the opportunity to get to the point where these gold leaves matters less, right? When you have the two items on pace, when Chovy can get to a next item, as oh, oh boy. Yeah. Yep, it's going to continue not being very uh, possible to be able to make those advantages happen. And if Faker gets into the shroud, Zay is going to follow off the kill, and now Faker is looking to try and get in there for more. Dashing after Canyon and Keen here. It is just Faker at the moment, but There's now you can see they make their way in. The paranoia comes down. Decent little utilization of the counter strike, but Faker's going to get another kill. Hostile oh, takeover means Keen is dead at the same time. And he's almost hit by that handshake. It could have been worse, and it's still a disaster. No mercy will be 
shown to their domestic rivals as T1 just run through Gen.G once more. There is no Barrett for them to get. 18 minutes in and they are slaughtering Gen.G. And Gen.G, the only reason why Barrett isn't taking is because we're 18 minutes in. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's nine to one, six and a half K gold lead here. And Genji, they can't even get there to waves. Game two was systematic dissection from Genji. They controlled the map, they were patient, and T1 were suffocated. But in this game, T1 are just brawling. It's the, a sledgehammer. It is a yeah. beatdown. And sure, a bit of anti synergy there is this knocks uh, Lahens out of the way of Faker's E. He flashes to try and cancel the back, doesn't quite get it in time, but he says, guys, I'm not letting my ulti be wasted. You better collapse here. Here comes Ona, and then the follow up comes through. T1 from these winning positions are always going to be looking for more and more aggressive sideline punishes. And Gen G, not respecting pace, just has to watch his teammates die. Nothing that he can do there. And the travel on the Shuriken backflip there as well from Faker. This guy, when he plays Akali at Worlds, it is just, it's just a beauty to watch. As we're straight into it once again. Magnus Storm gonna come down. This could be a pick as Carrier. Actually more tanky than we might have expected. He gets bailed out as well. As Faker gets another one, make it to his owner. He's in on the action still. He's going to go down. The cast just to remove Pays. And Gumiushi is on a rampage. Keen is on the floor. And T1 are looking to shut out this game. Carrier doesn't even die, gets the full value from the bailout. The TP comes in, and they're not going to relent. Chovy and Pace just, again, have to watch their teammates fall one after another, after another. T1 is just crushing Gen.G with their wallets right now. Genji admirably tried to find the pick, but you said it yourself, Atlas. Carrier way tankier than they were expecting. Yeah. And... Uh, while they expected to one-shot Carrier, he bought enough time to allow T1 to collapse and turn it around. Now, the Baron is on the Rift. Another bad fight for Gen.G will result in that objective falling. And you can see the vision coming through from the hands. He dropped three wards in a nice little triangle, I guess, to just try and make sure that they have some semblance of information. Yeah, with, maybe something won't get swept. Yeah. With how deep in they are, like even a good fight might mean Baron is gone, but maybe you got like a bounty or two. Things are looking dire, and unlike some of the uh, previous games, the range wave clear is really lackluster when it comes to these Baron minions. Oh, Handshake going to connect there. Not a lot of follow-up onto Lehens, as they didn't have a lot of information. Red buff is the prize that they're looking for, but it's going to get reset, and it looks like Ona should be able to take control of it. Into the Shroud goes oh, Faker, go. now Paranoia. They think they might have them where they want them, as over the wall goes Jovi. He's got the flank angle, and they take down Guma to start off the fight, but it has to be paid for by Keen. Now a four versus four as T1 look to rally back into position. Can they win the fight without Guma is the question. He's so much of their consistent damage. Is now Chovy dancing around, not able to find too much more, and T1 back away. You're completely right, Atlas. Losing Guma is a lot of the damage gone, so T1 have to be a lot more careful. Faker had his ultimate available, but they chose not to take the fight any longer. A crucial flank from Chovy. He's been largely invisible in this game, quietly farming on the side, but you look at his itemization, he is on pay. I mean, he's ahead of Faker in terms of itemization. So there are still avenues for Genji to turn this around, but they need to find more picks like this. A very deep TP starts this off, and it's hard to respond 41 because they don't have the vision. The Nocturne denies them so much, but this is where the wallets come through. Even with the carry being taken out immediately, Genji don't really have an opportunity to chase further because if they get another kill there onto maybe Faker, you turn it into a Baron, the game might be playable instead. It's a moment of respite, but T1 still have a very tight clutch Faker. in this game. Yeah, Faker actually looking for Chovy here as he gets into the Shroud. The rest of T1 now moving up. The arrow not going to connect. As Genji are now looking to back away, now it's Zayas' turn to start a bit of an engage with a body slam. And this push and pull, Genji putting that Phalanx back together. All about this Baron right now. No one really being able to get too much ground. Crucially, the Dragon is completely exposed. The bot wave has been pushed in by T1. Faker commits his ultimate to try and force something out from Chovy, but he holds his nerve, doesn't get dissuaded, still has his ulti available. But the problem is all of Genji was shepherded to the top side of the map, leaving the mid lane exposed. T1 get the objective, and now they can turn to the Dragon.
Yep, Trish Operage is going to spot that that's exactly what T1 are intending. Oh. Only going to start that one up, but you can see Keen so far away from this on that bottom side of the map, and it's because the map is so incredibly wide and dark that it's very difficult for Gen G to get down there as Lahens trying to set a trap here for anyone who unwittingly moves towards his top side. The Drake will just be taken here, evening out that count two for two, but. Next one going to be very, very scary because a four Drake uh, Hextech Soul sounds um, sounds un unbeatable. Uh, Shattering Strike going to get a fair bit of value here, but Lahens still in a whole lot of trouble as Faker looking for them. Still dashing forward as the Paranoia does come down. The stun is gorgeous. The execution is perfect. And now Chovy looking to try and get out of there with that Spirit Rush and T1. They play it slow. They accept that they're going to take that pick and they're looking for more now as far as control of this map. you got to remember that T1 just took a drag and they need to get the reset through Crucially in all of this, while the trap was turned on its head, notice that Chobi has a two-level lead over Faker. He has been over-grouping, and he has been denied a lot of farm. Even that top wave just now, he conceded over to Zayas to make sure that he was getting the resources. And while there are advantages across the board, Chovy becomes the sole win condition for Genji. If he's able to find those picks, if he can find an opportunity, then there is an avenue back into this game for Genji. And while the Baron damage for T1 is pretty solid, right? You have Vi passive, you have uh, Gumayushi, he will shred through it fairly quickly. It's so hard to deny Nocturne access to the pit. True. And we saw T1 themselves show that a single Baron steal can be enough to turn a game on its head. And T1, I imagine, is going to be looking, unless they get a really good Baron opportunity, just start stacking these Drakes. Because the Baron actually does a ton of damage, even as we get this late into the game. You gotta have to really respect it. Not really the same for the dragons, but that, even if you end up going for that, how, as dangerous as a four Drake Hextech Soul is, that's eight and a half minutes from now. And at that point, the gold lead isn't gonna be quite as useful. I think T1, they're gonna look for a pick onto someone, turn that into Baron, and truly break the back of Gen G. Well, Trevi hasn't been back to base in what feels like a decent amount of time because he's been sitting on exactly these items for the last what feels like seven minutes or something like that. But now Gen.G are poised. They're in their jungle, understanding that T1 do want to look for this Baron. They do have control vision of the area. They can get over these walls pretty comfortably. Azona going to dive into the back of the pit, take down that ward, and now T1 are going to start this one yeah. up. Paranoia can get Canyon into that pit anytime he wants, but they do need to get vision of it. They find that vision right now, and T1 immediately back away. The amount of respect being shown this game is incredibly high. T1 not wanting to give an inch. They can just keep doing this, though. Keep forcing cooldowns. Eventually, Genji is going to run out of wards, run out of scryers, and they are going to have to face check. They've, yeah, they, they don't have the blue trinket on Pays. I know it looks like that on the bottom of your screen, but it is unavailable. It's the only one on their side. There they you also, go. Ezreal, just to check. Yep. That T1 are playing with the pressure that they have well. Forcing Genji into this uncomfortable position. Resets have come through from T1. Vision replenished now for Carrier as he makes his way back out onto the map. Faker gonna go and catch the bot wave as Chofi gets ever closer to level 16. Only picks up a needlessly large rod, so maybe it hadn't been as long as I thought. The it's intensity a of the game might be uh, playing, uh, attributing to that one. It's a surprisingly tense game considering the gold deficit right. that Genji find themselves in. And I really do think it's because you just keep looking at Chovy, you see how strong he is on this Ari, and uh, you have to respect it. T1, though, doing what they've done all game. They move into Genji's jungle and say, by the way, this belongs to us. Please vacate the premises as we take all of your jungle camps. Yeah, and this is the thing. This is the slowly but surely drawing out the advantage, right? This is the safe way. Uh, to win the game. T1 have been known to uh, take some liberties as far as advantages are concerned. Oh, yeah. And this time around, not necessarily doing so as much. But what it's doing is giving Pays time to get farm, giving Chovy time to get more levels and farm himself. And so maybe when Pays has three items, Chovy has three items, that could be a time where 100%. You know, a fight can be better here for Gen G. But I, I still think that T1 have a lot of great tools in these team fights later on. Zayas on his Gragas has made magic happen. T1 and on his Akali needs no introduction. And Gumiyushi on this champion that, if given the space, can really lose control. I mean, I think that this is a recipe for success for T1, unless Gen.G does something miraculous. I, I love that you said T1 on Akali, as opposed to Faker on Akali, which actually <laughs> yeah, sorry, is synonymous, it's right? Fair, it's, it's synonymous. It's, it's perfect. And the level 60 now hit, as you pointed out, Vadi is getting those free items hit. And it's, it's really weird because I do feel like T1 was absolutely demolishing this game. I still think they are highly favored in this game. They're going to get yeah, the soul course. point. 
And I don't think Gen G really has any thing that they can do about that. But there's got to be a point where the Inips have to start falling or the Baron has to be threatened as the check comes through. Yep. Obviously quite early, but not those, really going to spot those anything. Those two dragons were so valuable because yeah. it kind of just bought them time. They can choose to concede this objective as well. The top wave being pushed in, Genji playing the side lanes methodically. They're not overforcing their hand. And uh, what felt like a beatdown earlier, it felt like that we were going round for round in a boxing match and T1 was just generating point after point after point. But now we're kind of in this back and forth, a lot of dodging's been happening and Genji have been able to stall out enough where it feels like their stamina has been regained and a single good punch from them could be enough to swing the whole game. Especially now that uh, third item does come through here for Pays. He's feeling a whole lot better in this game right now. And on his Ezreal, we know that Ezreal can do some pretty ridiculous things as the game goes on, thanks to Elk for letting us know. Pays is no stranger to it. This was, in fact, one of his first mains that we ever saw oh, yeah. him in Challenger is something that Chronicle will not shut up about. Well, I... I was going to talk about it, actually, but thank you for, uh, for being That's good. That, that, that yeah. helps. That goes with the yeah. vibe. Well, smart. Well, no, I, I like don't have that. to. <laughs> I feel like you've cast with him before. Yeah, yeah no, I've, I've seen him around. Every now and then. He and looks like an imposter. He looks like Chronicler from back in the LCK, but he's got this moustache, so it can't <laughs> be him. <laughs> As T1 desperately <laughs> tries to catch someone of Genji uh, off guard. For T1, though, the guarantee of the next Drake setup is amazing because Genji has only two Drakes, so they can very happily give that up. Whereas Genji, 100% is going to have to play towards that soul. I know that in theory you can do the, okay, you get soul, we get Baron, but it, it's Hextech soul. We saw in the previous game how hard the game becomes to play out. And Guma's volleys alone are going to be an absolute nuisance if you're trying to play, particularly if you're trying to play very far forward, very aggressively. The slow makes it so hard. Genji. Still setting up these traps, but it's so easy for T1 to check. Yeah, Hawkshot is a pretty powerful ability. Trisha Barrage not going to find any joy here. It's Faker on a flank angle taking control of the mid lane. And you've got the split pushing Gragas, that nimble large man moving in the bottom lane. I just trying to put pressure on Genji. I don't, I don't know if you guys ever get this, but I have this weird feeling that oh, yeah. Chovy's going to do something really crazy. Like in your waters? <laughs> Uh, oh, oh, Owner. oh, yeah, Owner was thinking about it. The arrow is going to go wide, but still Spirit Rush has oh. to be invested as Pace gets caught by a handshake, and now over the wall they go, but Owner might be going a little bit too far. You've got Zayas coming in, though, just trying to be the hero. And speaking of heroes, Zayas finds Pace, but not enough damage. Lahens, the first to go down in the exchange, and now Genji are scattered. Pace is dead, and Zayas says, you cannot take this belly. It's going to be Canyon that goes down next. T1 will take down this inhibitor turret. It took a little while, but I think they're just going to move through and win game three. And all the tension deflates as the turn around is found. T1 not going to let Genji claw their way back in this game. Canyon tries to flash just to clear the wave. Yeah, King desperately trying to hold him, but he cannot. And now it's Chovy left on his lonesome. He's going to need to be that hero as these minions are going to now join these Nexus turrets. Lahens just trying to buy some time, and he knows that this game is over. Chovy just trying to get back to his fountain. Goes golden alongside Faker. Point. 